So OK, so um, I'd like to welcome you to another um, fabulous event in this lecture series on science and cooking. And as always in this lecture series, we want to start by thanking um, the many sponsors and people who have helped make this possible. This is, um, this is a list of our sponsors. Um, and they include Jose Andres' Think Food Group and the Alicia Foundation um, from Ferran Adria. So these two both provided financial support and also um, intellectual support, without which, without them, we would um, you know, they really helped catalyze this entire thing. Um, I'd also like to thank Whole Foods, who um, has done really what to us is a remarkable thing, which is to donate um, all of the food for the laboratory portion of this course. Um, and also to deliver it, and um, and um, in most, and it's really a, a fabulous thing. In most weeks, um, we would show you one of the recipes, the delicious recipes that the students have made. But this week, they're studying for an exam, and so um, I, I don't get to show you a recipe, but I will show you something. Um, and um, so also the Harvard University Office of um, the Senior Fo Provost, um, Cole Palmer has donated um, equipment to the lab. So this coming week, we're, the recipe of the week is ricotta cheese. And the students are going to use um, wonderful pH meters donated by Cole Palmer to actually quantify the making of cheese, Le Creuset, Mars, and the Asade Business School. And we are really grateful to all of these sponsors who have made this event possible. OK. OK, so my job, this is like, this is the warm-up act. I'm sort of getting used to being a warm-up act, but I'm not good at it now, and I wasn't before. So my job is to do the following thing. In 10 minutes, and I promise to only talk for at most 10 minutes, I'm going to summarize the science of the last week of the course. Um, so there are about 40 slides. There are way too many slides. But I'm going to try to give you the idea of what we did, and then Grant will take over and, do his, and perform his magic. So that's the, the plan. So the topic for the week was protein unfolding and coagulation. Oh, but actually, before showing you this, I wanted to show you one picture of food. Usually, we start by showing you a beautiful recipe made by the students. Um, but as I said, they're all sadly studying for an exam. They did have fun this week, though. And just to demonstrate this, you'll remember our speaker from last week, Enrique Rivera. And this was Enrique making chocolate with the students. Students, um, and they made this house. OK, so the topic for this week is protein folding and unfolding. And the question that I want to ask to start this off is, what do all of these pictures have in common? So this is ceviche, this is a custard, these are shrimp noodles, and this is an egg. And the answer is, there are two answers. They're all part of the labs in this class. Um, <laughs> That's the first answer. Um, but the second is they all involve the denaturing and coagulation of proteins. And so every week we have a theme, we have learning objectives, and we had an equation. Now, for those of you who have been here before, you know you're supposed to clap for the equation, but not yet, because I have to explain it to you first. Um, the theme of the week is that the, pro the unfolding and coagulation of proteins is central to cooking. And this can happen with a variety of different stimuli, including heat, acidity, salt, and enzymatic activity. And if I show you nothing else, I'll show you at least one remarkable picture of this in this um, brief introduction. And then we have an equation which really encapsulates all of these ideas. So OK, so, we, um, so the lecture started in the class by asking, what is protein denaturation? What is coagulation? And how do we cause this to happen during cooking? And why does it happen? What are the underlying scientific mechanisms for it? Um, for those of you who were here in our first week when Joan Roca um, gave a lecture, we talked about the phase behavior of water. And we talked about the fact that the liquid gas transition, which is the boiling of of water um, basically corresponds to a transition between two regimes, one in which the molecules like to stick, stick to each other, and the other is in which the molecules like to move away from each other. And we had an equation of the week from the first week which quantified this um, transition. So in food, there are also transitions. These are the various transitions that occur when you cook an egg. And these are more complicated. This is an egg. This is cooking fish. Um, the cooking fish um, involves the denaturing of a protein and coagulation called myosin. This is cooking the fish again. This is actually plotting the cooking of a fish not as a function of temperature, but as a function of pH. And actually, in one of the labs in this class, we showed that the transition happens at about pH 2. And the point is, the point of this week, and the point that I would like to leave all of you with, is that all of these transitions involve a complicated but rather simple to encapsulate process. And it's a two-step process, which involves proteins, um, which are ingre major ingredients of food. You've all seen them on food labels. And these um, processes unfold the proteins, which are initially folded up into a long thing. And then the long things stick to each other. 
And that's what happens. All of those processes involve this long thing unfolding and sticking to each other. And the point that we emphasized in the class was that these two phenomena um, can be uh, controlled as a function of temperature, salt concentration, and pH. OK, so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that when tuna is uncooked, the protein myosin within it is folded, whereas when it's cooked, as it is in the crust around this tuna, something that we actually showed in a lecture one day in this class, um, the, um, the protein is actually unfolded and coagulated. And, um, and, um, and that's basically the way it goes. And so the point is, and this is, um, I'm almost done, don't worry. Um, the point is that, um, that there are many ways to drive this process when cooking. And if you look at recipes and you start to look and ask the recipes what is actually going on, you can identify and indeed quantify um, various places where this process is occurring um, and, and being controlled in a variety of different ways. And just to demonstrate this, I'm going to show you a couple of recipes. And then I think my warm-up act is about over. I'm almost out of steam. There are about 20 more slides, but I'm running out of steam. So let me show you a couple of recipes that we talked about in the class, which I think are sort of interesting. Um, one is poached eggs. So now the interesting thing about poached eggs, it's a very simple recipe. You simply take vinegar, which is an acid, and you pour it into water with eggs. And when you do that, um, then um, when you put vinegar and you crack the egg in the water, it forms a cohesive mass, and you don't have to cook it for very long to get a cooked egg. Whereas when you boil an egg, when you normally hard boil an egg, it takes much longer. This is because vinegar is an acid, and it facilitates protein um, unfolding and coagulations for reasons that we described this week to the students. So another um, interesting process um, is the famous 100-year-old eggs. Has anyone eaten a 100-year-old egg? That's good. Um, have you ever eaten a 100 year old? Grant hasn't eaten a 100 year old egg. OK, so, um, so, and, so a 100 year old egg actually has a very interesting recipe. This is a recipe that we found on the web for a 100 year old egg. What you're supposed to do is boil the hot water. Then you're supposed to pour in salt. You're supposed to pour in an enormous quantity of salt, one quart of salt. Then what you're supposed to do is put the eggs in a jar without breaking them. Wait till the water cools, so not hot water, and then pour the water in a jar and seal it. And it turns out if you do this, it cooks the egg. So think about that. Of course, it comes out. It doesn't exactly look like this, but it looks sort of different um, when it comes out. And actually, in fact, if you change the treatment, this is, the, this is my last slide. I think I'm going to stop after this. I feel like I'm running out of steam. Oh, no, I have to show you the equation of the week. We need you to clap. Right. If you change the treatment, then actually you can cook the egg to make it look in different ways. So these are eggs that are prepared with various solutions, um, and they can turn colors. And, you know, and this all doesn't involve the application of heat. It just involves protein denaturation in some sort of a way. So it's really a very rich topic, and it's one that clearly we could talk about for a long time. So now I'm going to very quickly switch through as many slides as I can until I get to the equation of the week. You're then going to clap, and then I'm going to introduce Grant. So this is what you see. We showed them the sequence, the, the amino acid sequence of fish myosin. It was so great. We did all these. We talked about tug of wars between hydrophobicity and entropy. You know, we have equations. We talked about this thing in terms of the equations. It was so great. Coagulation. You know, we kept going. We just keep talking. Then we talked about charged amino acids and how they're important. We put charges on our protein. We 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 changed our tug of war, um, and then we ended up with the equation of the week. And so, very good. And so I didn't explain the equation of the week to you because there wasn't time, sorry. Um, and also, um, you're all here to listen to Grant, not to me. So, um, so, but instead, um, um, I, I'll just tell you that the equation of the week um, represents the balance that has to occur for proteins to unfold. And that balance involves the balance between three types of different forces. One is what is called hydrophobicity, which is the idea that Parts of proteins don't like being in water. The other is entropy, which Dave talked about in great detail several weeks ago. I forgot when now. And the third is electrostatics. And the equation of the week is essentially a mnemonic to allow you to think about the competition between these two effects. And what we told the students, and what I'll tell you, is that it turns out that calculating anything precisely, which we sometimes do in, this, in the class, is hard. It, people get PhDs for doing it, and so the class was safe. We can't ask you to calculate very much, which they were quite happy with after what we did to them last week. So um, with that, that's the end. That's the end of my um, preamble. Um, and it, instead, um, I would like to um, welcome Grant Ackett, um, who's come all the way from Chicago to tell us about reinventing food flavor and texture. And one of the things, actually, that for those of you who've been coming to this lecture series that I would encourage you all to do and that we're going to do in listening to Grant is to just think about all of the scientific ideas that we've talked about thus far, far in this lecture th series and see how they exist throughout his 
lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Excited to be here. Um, wait a minute, who is that? There they are. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about flavor and texture. And we're going to articulate that through basically the creative process that we use at Alinea. There's Mike. Hey, Mike. Um, first, I'm going to run a quick video that is going to basically introduce the restaurant visually to you kind of give you a sense of what we do and, and how we do it really quick. And then we'll, we'll break right into, uh, into some more specific examples. So we're good here? All right, so there's Alinea, for those of you that have never heard of it. 
We're good? All right, so right, flavor is, to me, more about smell than actually what's on the palate. So if you think about um, what you taste, a lot of people say there's four. Some people believe in umami. That makes five. Uh, like it, abil your ability to taste is based on those five, four or five things that your tongue can detect, your palate. But you can detect over eight or 900 specific food smells. And we're going to start with some examples here. It occurred to me younger when I was working at the at French Laundry back in like 1998 when Thomas, the chef, would take a blend of spices and throw them on a hot plate right before it went out to the dining room. And I always thought it was just for aesthetics. I thought it was for looks. But really what he was trying to do was flavor that dish from those spices that he sprinkled on that hot plate. So what we've done is we've kind of taken that thought and really tried to focus on it, exaggerate smell. This is an example of a course where we skewer the food on a vanilla bean and tempura fry the end. We call this the aromatic handle technique. So the guest is asked to pick up the bite of food by the vanilla bean, lower it into their mouth. Obviously, the proximity of that action puts the vanilla bean very close to their nose, flavors the bite with smell. Some more examples, <clears throat> excuse me, some smoking cinnamon, complimenting a, a bison dish with beets. And this is a concept where <clears throat> we have rosemary on the table prior to the guest arriving. It's in a holder. And at some point in their meal, <clears throat> excuse me, the brick comes with the lamb on it that has a hole drilled in it. And the front of the house will take out the rosemary, place it in the 600 degree brick. It activates the volatile oils in the rosemary and flavors the bites of lamb from the smell. One other, <clears throat> one other aspect of, of smell that I think is important is how it can affect your memory. And one question we ask ourselves all the time is, can memory affect flavor? So we have all have fond memories probably of growing up and being in your family's home around the holidays where every year you would cook the same thing, your mother, your grandmother, apple pie, roast chicken, whatever it is. And so you're, you have those memories. One question is, if you remember those and they're pleasant memories, can they make the food that you're eating taste better? And that's one thing that we try to do with this course. So I grew up in Michigan, and it was very popular to rake the oak leaves in your front yard into a pile. You and your friends would jump in them. Your bigger brother, the bully on the street, would shove the leaves down your shirt. And then eventually, you'd light them on fire. Now, that's probably not happening so much anymore. But um, so for me, fall was the smell of burning oak leaves. And so it was a very important part of my childhood. And as soon as I smell that, I'm transported back in time to, to a good place. When chefs cook now, it's obvious that the priorities are on seasonal, fresh ingredients. Every cook, every chef working today pretty much abides by that. But what they don't, what a lot of people don't incorporate into their dishes is seasonal smells. So we said we're going to, using the same concept that, of the aromatic handle that I, that I talked about with the vanilla bean, we take oak branches, we get them from our, our local florist, and clean them, strip down the end like, you would a, like it would be a bamboo skewer, basically. And we put seasonal ingredients on the end, in this case, pheasant, roasted shallot, and apple cider gelée set with agar agar. And we tempura fry it. And basically, right before it goes out into the dining room, we take a torch and we light the leaves on fire. It's delivered to the table, as you see it there, smoldering, the smell of smoldering oak leaves with a bite of highly seasonal food. So we have a video here. I'll show you how we put it together. 
like I said, <clears throat> we get the branches, we trim them down, peel it with the peeler, and we have uh, pheasant breast that's been poached and sous vide at 62 degrees Celsius. Uh, the apple, apple cider, like I said, is apple cider cooked with orchard apples and set with agar agar so that it remains a gel under, under pretty extreme heat of the fryer. And then a roasted shallot. So that's tempura fried. The tempura batter is a little bit untraditional in that we don't use any egg products. It's simply uh, carbonated water, flour, cornstarch, and baking soda. And we're frying it at like 375 or so. A lot of people burn their hands doing this. <laughs> it's one of those rites of passage at Alinea. See how many you can fry at one time. You're pretty cool if you can do like six or seven. So then we light them on fire. Like I said, they go out to the dining room. And we've had people, I'm not exaggerating, we've had people cry when they get this course. Because, in a good way. Because, <laughs> not because, not because the ash fell in their lap and burned them. Um, but, you know, it, it's a really powerful thing. Smell memory is a very powerful thing. So the question, the question I go back to is, if you're building these memories through your childhood, or at any time, and you take a bite of food while you're remembering something, does it make the food taste better? I think it does. So, speaking on smell again, can something taste better when it's at the peak of its season before you even taste it? In other words, we all know that really good ripe tomatoes happen in mid to late summer. And the tomatoes are perfect. You grew them in your backyard. What if I blindfolded you and gave you a crummy hothouse tomato and one that was right out of the garden, perfectly ripe? And then we gave you something to smell while you were tasting them both. Would you be able to tell the difference? I don't know. I think it makes a, a, a big impact in our flavor perception when we smell things. So let's take out of your little uh, Chinese to-go box there. And you'll see uh, a clear envelope. Go ahead and smell that envelope. Is that easily recognizable? I can smell it from here. <laughs> Stuff's intense, right? Everybody knows what that smell is, right? Can somebody tell me? It's fresh cut grass. So for me, what, what is summer? Summer is, unfortunately, for some people, mowing the lawn. And if the smell of summer is quintessentially fresh cut grass, can the smell of summer make a tomato dish taste better? So we have a little video. <clears throat> So what you saw there uh, was a vaporizer. And what we do is we take fresh cut grass and we put it in the chamber of that vaporizer. 
And on the other side of that chamber is a plastic bag that collects the scented, the grass scented air, essentially. <clears throat> the bag is sealed so the aroma can't escape. And then we puncture small holes in it with the syringe. We tuck it into a linen pillowcase so it's a little bit more pre presentable in our environment. The pillow goes out to the table um, and the plate is set on top of it, as you saw in the intro video. And slowly, the weight of the plate pushes out the smell of the grass around the very simple tomato dish. So a lot of times when I go out to the dining room or people come back to the kitchen, they say, Chef, you know, why did you combine these flavors? Like, what, what, what is wrong with you? Like, how do you come up with this stuff? <laughs> and it's weird for me because all of the flavor pairings that we do None of them seem unusual to me. It's just the way that I guess my head is wired. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. OK, so this one, chamomile tea, honey, lemon, and striped bass. So we would put this dish on the menu, and somebody would go, why are you putting tea with fish? And to me, I don't think of chamomile as a beverage that you drink. I think of it as an herb. So I smell the chamomile, I taste the chamomile, and I get a very herbaceous quality out of it, a very perfumey herbaceous quality that I feel pairs well with seafood. So now you have, basically in this idea, you have a deconstructed cup of chamomile tea. So you have the lemon element, the yellow, sheet that goes over the top is a, a gel made with conventional animal gelatin and agar agar. Very heavily steeped chamomile tea with lemon, a little bit of saffron, um, tarragon, and chervil. So to me, I don't look at it like strangely like a cup of tea and fish. I look at it like striped bass with lemon and herbs. This one is even a little bit more scary for people to wrap their head around. This is a dessert with olive oil, green pichelin olives, almond, and orange. So people would say, why are you giving me salty uh, olives with my dessert? So basically, in this example, we take what would normally be a conventional savory food pairing. Like if I said to you, oranges, olive oil, almonds, you're thinking south of France, maybe Spain in a salad form, something like that. It's not that unconventional. As soon as we turn it into a dessert, it becomes unusual. But we already know that the flavors work together. So now in the kitchen, what we have to do is we have to adjust the sugar level and the salt level and make it sweeter, push it to that sweet side, and bring in some balance. So if you look at it, you pull it apart, the olive oil is turned into an ice cream very fatty and rich mouth coating. The orange is turned into a sorbet, very acidic. The almond is a cookie on the bottom. And the green olive is, there's some actual green olives in there. And then we take the brine of the olive and thicken it with pectin and make like an olive brine pudding. And that adds the salinity that balances the bitterness of the olive oil the creaminess of the olive oil ice cream and the acidity from the orange. Watermelon and fish. So this is a very special Japanese fish, highly seasonal in the middle of summer, called ayu, AKA watermelon fish. So we get this fish from a, a purveyor that flies it in from the Tsukiji market. I grab it for the first time and smell it, and it smells like watermelon. And that's obviously why they give it the nickname. So I say to myself, well, <laughs> the fish is not literally made of watermelon. It just smells like watermelon. So we're in the kitchen, and a bunch of us are standing around. We're poking at the fish. We're smelling it. What are we going to do with this beautiful fish? Well, it smells intensely of watermelon. Let's serve it with watermelon. When we approach creating a new dish, there's a couple of different avenues of creativity that we use. And one of them we call 
a technique called flavor bouncing. So imagine if you have white beans, right? I want to make a white bean puree. We're in the, let's say it's fall. The way we would go about creating this dish is we come up with a laundry list of every ingredient that we can think of that goes with white beans. So clearly, we're not going to have all of these ingredients on the plate. So we have to eliminate some. And here's the process that we use. Basically, the way this works is if you have your focal ingredient in the middle, let's say it's white beans. You're trying to build a dish around that. So typically how I start is I'll say the first thing that comes to mind, I'll say something like bacon, right? I know bacon or any type of pork product, pancetta, uh, ham, they all go with white beans, right? So then I'll go, okay, well, what goes with bacon? That also goes with white beans. So maybe I'll say apple or pear. So apple and pear go with bacon, they also go with white beans. So now the next one that enters the equation, say it's maple syrup. Now maple syrup needs to go with white beans, which it does. It needs to go with apples, which it does. It needs to go with bacon or pan or ham, which it does. So you keep building this kind of system, what we call bouncing flavors. So basically, you just keep going uh, let's throw an oddball one in there. Um, beer, right? So does Guinness go with white beans? Sure, everybody drinks beer with their pork and beans, right? Does beer go with maple syrup? Absolutely, they make some beer with maple syrup. Does beer go with apples? Well, of course, you can drink beer with apples. And does beer go with bacon? Well, everything goes with bacon. So, of course, beer goes with bacon. So you keep going like this, and you build, you build the flavors this way, and you just keep bouncing them off each other. Beer and almonds? Yeah, when you're sitting at the bar, you eat salted almonds. Almonds with bacon? Sure. The only rule to this is that, starting with the focal ingredient, whatever supporting component that you put in the puzzle, has to go with every other one. Let's say instead of beer, we would have went with red wine. Okay, I can see red wine going with beans. I can't really see red wine going with maple syrup. Red wine could go with apples. Red wine certainly goes with pork products and red wine could go with almonds, but it doesn't go with the maple syrup, so it can't be in the equation. And that's why we went with beer, as long as they follow the rule. So that's one way that we approach coming up with a new dish. And based on that right there, this was the final plate. Very simple. <laughs> so the idea, <clears throat> what's interesting about the presentation is that it was also directly informed by me doodling on the paper, which I thought was just kind of a happy coincidence. But basically, you have the white bean puree in the middle, on top of pancetta chip. On top of that, a tuft of Guinness foam, some micro parsley. The maple syrup came in with the sauce. Um, this tumbleweed here is basically homemade tomato leather and mango leather twirled together. Apple, molasses. It works. And as they're, as they're consuming the dish, the front of the house tells them that Ideally, what they do is the three components in the middle will always be present on your spoon. So you would go straight down and then pull out or push out and get one of the other flavors on the bite. So every time you're getting Guinness bacon and bean, sometimes you might get, pan or sometimes you might get tomato and mango, the other time you're getting roasted garlic, and so on and so forth. All right, texture. So chefs obviously focus on flavor. And we tinker with it, and we, we refine it, and it's a priority, we're cooking. But 
now, especially with the cooking that we do and what's becoming more popular in progressive uh, cuisine is the prioritization of texture. And there's a couple of reasons why we play with texture, but one of them is for an element of surprise, which is very important in the cooking that I do. So a couple of examples of sensation and surprise when we're playing with texture. This is a course we call the black truffle explosion. And literally what we have is a truffle stock that we gel with conventional animal gelatin. We roll it in between two sheets of normal pasta and make a ravioli. And then when you throw that ravioli in the water, because the gelatin is thermal reversible, it turns back to a liquid inside the pasta. And then obviously when you bite it, it explodes. And this dish has been around for a really long time and I have a hard time getting rid of it because people really, really dig it. Temperature contrasts. So this concept, um, I collaborate with a designer by the name of Martin Kastner and he creates all the special serviceware for the restaurant. So I came to Martin and I said, I want to create a service piece that we can separate temperature until right before the guest consumes it. So they can have hot and cold in their mouth at the same time. Now, I don't know if many of you have experienced that, but it's, it's a pretty neat sensation. So I have a little video here of what we came up with. I hope, there we go. All right, so Martin said, okay, what we should do is we should make a paraffin wax bowl about the size of an oyster shell. And he chose wax because we can put a pin through it, which you'll see later becomes very important. Um, but basically he liked the tactile feel of it, the thermal qualities of it. So when you're picking up the cold soup, the cold potato soup that's in the bottom, it doesn't make your hand feel cold and it's comfortable on the mouth. So what we do is we take potatoes and we cook them in cream with truffles. And we Parisian scoop or melon ball out some more potatoes and cook them in clarified butter. Soup gets strained. We pour the paraffin wax into a specially made mold. And the cooks have to do that themselves, which is, I think, interesting in that they're responsible for not only the food, but the vessel in which the food is served in. There aren't too many restaurant kitchens in the world where on somebody's station they have blocks of paraffin wax. So a stainless steel pin is pushed through the wax bowl. On the pin we have a tiny cube of Parmesan cheese, tiny cube of butter, a little piece of chive. In the bowl goes the cold potato soup at about 40 degrees. And then the hot potato sphere that's been cooked in clarified butter, so it's about 240 degrees or so. Goes out to the dining room. The guest is instructed to pick up the bowl in one hand and with the other hand pull the pin, releasing the garnishes into the soup. And then slurp it back like an oyster. They get the hot potato sphere and the cold potato soup at the same time. So this is what we call the ball shot. So what you see in that crate and barrel shot glass is celery juice, a micrio encased apple juice, and some celery leaves on top. So what you're instructed to do is take that glass, knock it back, open up wide so the ball kind of rolls out of the glass, falls into your mouth, and then, of course, when you close your mouth, the ball explodes, releasing the apple juice that's inside. So same concept as the black truffle explosion. We juice Granny Smith apples, season them with salt, sugar, and malic acid. We freeze them in sphere molds. We take micrio, white chocolate, horseradish, sugar, salt, and distilled vinegar, 
and make basically uh, Mikrio's cocoa powder, or cocoa butter, basically. Make kind of like a savory white chocolate. We take the frozen apple juice, put it on a pin, dip it quickly in the Mikrio, put it back in the refrigerator, so the Mikrio sets instantly on the frozen apple. Back into the refrigerator where the apple juice then melts, returns to a liquid. And you can see this is the, the finished ball. And with a little bit of pressure, they basically just blow up. So the, the wall is very thin, maybe you know, 30 seconds of an inch or something. It's very, very delicate and fragile. And the sensation is very cool. All right, so now we're actually going to give you a little bit of a demo. In the, <clears throat> in the white box, if you can dig out the other little goodie in there. So what that is, is a little container of dried caramel. So we talk about texture and surprise and that sort of thing. Well, what we have is very simply, uh, Christian here has caramel that's going in the RoboCoop. So burnt sugar, heavy cream, essentially. And we have tapioca maltodextrin here. So what he's going to do is take the caramel, food process it with the tapioca maltodextrin, which allows us to essentially dry it out, the maltodextrin being um, a fat soluble. Sounds like you're eating it. Um, so it, it's just an interesting way to, one, manipulate texture in that the caramel the caramel appears to be very dry and powdery, feathery and light, the opposite of what caramel normally is, which is very mouth coating and chewy and, you know, unctuous. And it allows us to present it in different ways. Um, and it allows us to kind of play with your mind. And then, of course, when you take it back, your saliva mixes with that tapioca maltodextrin and basically returns the entire thing back into a chewy, gooey caramel. You ever used one of these before? <laughs> we had, we filled 1,000 of those little cups last night at Alinea. <laughs> we had 35 people and laid out 1,000 of those cups and filled them all. We were there till like 3.30 in the morning. So basically, yeah, I mean, you have it, but this is the, the finished product. It's really light, feathery. And then obviously with any pressure or any moisture, it returns back into the gooey caramel. All right. So more, more textural manipulation. Salad. Most people have salad in this country before their main courses, but traditionally served after the main courses and kind of is used as more of a palate cleanser. Usually it's some type of vinaigrette, has a high level of acid. The greens themselves are usually pretty bitter. Um, and it goes at the end of the meal to cleanse, transitioning you into dessert. But to me, a palate cleanser, that is not palate cleansing to me. I understand the logic behind it. I understand the acid. I understand the bitterness. But chewing on something, to me, is not palate cleansing. To me, palate cleansing is something that you put in your mouth and it vanishes, and you're left with nothing, no residual matter. It's very light, it's very acidic, whatever it is, but it should be gone, removed of all texture. So we started looking at the salad, 
And we said, basically, how can we strip all the texture away, keep the bitter elements? So we decided to run the salad through the juicer. So we take various greens in certain proportions, and we run them through the champion juicer. One of, one of my ex-cooks back here, back in Trio in 2002, can tell you it's not fun to run salad through a juicer. <laughs> right, Mike? <laughs> so we, we juice the greens. We season them with salt uh, and black pepper. We freeze them. Once it's frozen, we take a fork and we grate it like a granita, and then scoop it into the bowl with some frozen red wine vinaigrette, a crack of black pepper over the top, and a drizzle of olive oil, and you have your palate cleansing salad. <laughs> I'm just going to roll this video. I'll talk about this one after we're done with the video here. So all kinds of cool stuff going on with that one. Um, yes, that was directly on the table. So what we do is we take, at one point in the meal, we'll roll out a silicone tablecloth that covers the entire table. Myself, the chef de cuisine, a couple of the other cooks in the kitchen will come out and we'll plate the course directly on the table surface. And the guests will eat directly off the table surface. But texture. So that was a frozen milk chocolate mousse, basically. So literally, chocolate and milk in a sous vide bag melted together, shake them up, pour it into an ISI canister, charge it with nitro, dispense the chocolate mixture into a bath of liquid nitrogen, which obviously makes it incredibly brittle, um, bring it out to the table, crack it at the table in front of people. As they eat, their first couple bites, they have crunchy chocolate. But as they work their way through the course, it tempers back into a more traditional mousse-like texture. In the glass cylinders, you saw uh, honey custard. So honey, cream, a little bit of salt, iota and kappa carrageenan. That's why when we go out to the table and we pour it from the pitcher, we have it timed so that by the time we get done finishing, <laughs> The rest of the dessert, we're able to lift that sleeve and it's set. That freaks people out. <laughs> and then uh, the other cool thing about it that is kind of science-y, but not, not really pertaining really to food science, was I don't know if you noticed, but the chocolate went square. That freaks people out, too. 
and that, that's simply from the grid pattern in the silicone and the density or the viscosity of the liquid, because some do and some don't. So you'll put the white sauce down, and it'll hold the perfect circle, and then you pour the chocolate sauce down, and it goes square, and they think you're Harry Potter. <laughs> All right. So another, another uh, avenue, I guess, a lot of people, avenue of creativity, a lot of people ask me, like I said, Chef, where does it come from? You know, how do you get your ideas? And I always say, well, it, you know, it's, it's the world around you, always. Like everything I look at, everything I hear, everything I touch, I think of food. So a couple of years ago, we were in the middle of a busy service on a Thursday night, and we have a very dear purveyor of ours, an older woman that owns a two-acre organic farm in Michigan, and she drives in every Thursday and delivers us products that she picked the morning of. And her raspberries are amazing. She walked in the back door of the restaurant carrying a flat of raspberries during the middle of the crush. And as she walked in, I could smell the raspberries from across the kitchen. Well, unfortunately, as I was breathing in and smelling the raspberries, a front of the house team member dropped a tray of wine glasses. And at Alinea, you, you don't drop things, <laughs> especially breakable things. So it was this collision of this fragrance of, of raspberries and the sound of this glass breaking that ultimately produced the dish. So we're going to roll this video. This is an entertaining video. That's not actually our farmer. We pulled that off of Flickr or something. <laughs> Obviously, thank you. When that happened, I was breathing in the raspberries. I heard the, gla the glasses fall and break. After I calmed down, I said to myself, I need to make raspberries like glass. I want to make them fragile. I want to make them translucent, transparent. And then that was the easy part, the idea. And then we had to go back in the kitchen and figure out how we were going to make a sheet of super fragile, crunchy, brittle raspberry. So what you saw basically is we cooked the raspberries down with a little bit of sugar. Um, we add some NH pectin. We pour it out on a sheet of acetate and roll it back and forth until it gets very, very thin. We dry it about 50% of the way until it becomes uh, like a fruit leather. Like um, cut it into shapes, put it back in the dehydrator, and dry it until it's crunchy. And that's what you got. So in this example, we, we manipulate the textures of familiar ingredients. In this case, you have pineapple and bacon. We actually render the bacon of its fat. So we kind of grind it up or chop it up and cook it over a medium heat until it releases all the fat. We actually strain out 
the solids and and discard them or or snack on them and then use the fat mix the fat with tapioca maltodextrin which absorbs the the fat and turns it into this powder um, that returns back to a liquid state when water touches it so when you first put it in your mouth it has the feel of a powder but as it kind of hydrates in your mouth it turns into this creamy smoky intensely salty bacon flavor which is really it's a really interesting sensation and the purpose really for the textural manipulation is is surprise you know diners are kind of confronted with this lozenge in this case that they're told is pineapple and bacon but when they look at it it looks nothing like pineapple and bacon and then when they actually put it in their mouth they're the textures are almost reversed because the pineapple becomes crispy um, when normally it's you know a softer style fruit and then the bacon which is people normally cook to a crispy consistency is now dry and powdery that kind of transforms into a creamy texture in their mouth it's it's a uh, it's a reversal in, in texture I would say and that becomes kind of the surprising element that people find entertaining and and kind of enjoy when they're when they're experiencing the restaurant and that's really what texture you know texture is a sensation so if we can if we can kind of manipulate and push things in certain directions that are a little bit more unfamiliar on the palate texturally um, it produces a more unique eating experience so that was made very much the same way only instead of NH pectin we used um, something called pure coat which is a modified tapioca starch um, cook the cook the pineapple add the pure coat goes through the same drying process the tapioca is pretty self-explanatory and then just wrap it when it's malleable and then dry it fully once the package is assembled and you literally crunch through and hit that bacon in the middle All right, so these are a couple examples of what we call frozen and chewy, little one bite courses that we do. Again, using uh, a modified starch. This one we use Ultratex 3. They have all these goofy names for them, right? Um, but basically, we figured out that when you thicken something and then subject it to different levels of freezing, obviously it's going to manipulate the texture in very different ways depending on how much you gel it and how much you freeze it and one thing that we found that was very pleasant was in this case you have a huckleberry so huckleberry juice thickened with the Ultratex um, put into a mold and frozen at I think this one was in 20 15 20 degrees um, it becomes very chewy almost like bubble gum but in a way that at least when I was a kid, when I would always eat bubble gum, I always wished that I could chew it for a while and then it would go away. Like you could swallow it or it would just go away. Well, that's what this does. So you put it in your mouth, you start chewing it, and it's very much like bubble gum. You're chewing, you're chewing, you're chewing, and it's just gone. Turn, turns back into a liquid and you swallow it. It's like the ultimate bubble gum. Same principle made with candy canes. So around the holiday time, we try to interject some like whimsical kind of nods to the season so we take literally take candy canes cook them down in milk thicken them with the ulcer tax freeze them so you get frozen and chewy candy cane same concept with cranberry uh, some bitter orange puree it's an interesting texture so unconventional ingredients kind of going back to what I was saying before about looking at everything and touching everything and thinking of food we often say to ourselves why can't we pair such and such with venison so for instance I like the smell of leather I want to eat leather <laughs> but I, I don't want to chew on leather so how do you incorporate that smell that potential flavor into a dish So we, we use a lot of trees. We feed people a lot of trees at Alinea. 
And you know, we look at pine trees, and basically it's a giant rosemary plant, basically, right? So here we have pine, and we get all excited about this idea. We're going we're gonna to cook with pine. We're going to serve people pine. What are we going to do with pine? We go out and get a tree, and it gets plunked down in the kitchen, and we're like, well, OK, well, what do we do with the pine now? Like, how do, we, how do you cook pine? So <laughs> we go out and buy a rotary evaporator. <laughs> and we take the pine needles, and we puree them up with water, and we throw them in the flask, and we distill it. And so now all of the non-palatable, needly material is left on, obviously, one side. And we get the essence of pine or spruce or whatever we want on the other. And then after we have that essence, we can manipulate it into whatever we want. In this case, you see a pine sorbet. And this dish is really interesting creatively because everything revolves around that pine. So we brought the pine in. And the pine was literally sitting in the kitchen. And we're all walking around it, looking at it, going, OK, pine. So we go out and we find mushrooms that only grow under pine trees, matsutake mushrooms. And we have our pine sorbet. So we turn the mushrooms into a puree. And that's the tan colored kind of shingle. And then we have a bunch of pine left over. So we smoke the fish in the pine. And then mango has some makeup that lends itself very well to pine flavor. So we put mango on the dish. So really, the whole thing was about the pine, something that basically is inedible. Hay. So I love the smell of hay. And I always wondered if hay was edible. You see animals eating hay. <laughs> Can't be that bad. So we go out and we get some organic hay from our farmer friend in Michigan. And we start playing with it. We throw it in the oven. We roast it. The smell is intensely nutty, like toasted hazelnuts. It was really interesting. So we say, OK, let's throw that toasted hay in a big pot of cream. <laughs> and we're going to make hay-infused cream. And it tastes like hazelnut custard. So we make a dessert out of it. We call it hay brulee. <laughs> So literally, we take the hay cream, and we set it with the iota and the caprocaridinin, and we sprinkle some sugar over it, and we brulee it. And if you don't tell people what it is, they think it's some sort of strange like nut that they've had. As soon as you tell them that it's hay, things change. <laughs> tobacco. <clears throat> some people like the smell of tobacco. Some people like the smell of tobacco leaf. Some people despise it. I always found it interesting. I worked at a winery for about a year, and I was always kind of really curious about how when you smell wine, it's only made from grapes. There's only one thing in it. But you smell leather, you smell chocolate, you smell other fruits. You smell all these things. So I started thinking about that with, with tobacco. Like, what can we pair with tobacco? What should go with tobacco? Does anybody, can anybody, when you think of tobacco, when you look at that photo, is there any foods that you think would pair with tobacco? No chefs. No cooks. Molasses. Molasses. Raisins. Where's Borelli? Pretty good, right? Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. So we decide to cook with it. And we decide to build components around it that support the flavor of tobacco. So we take the cigar or the tobacco leaf, whichever. We crumple it up. We infuse it into cream. We make a custard out of it. And then we start looking at tobacco itself for the inspiration. We incorporate a very floral uh, Thai long peppercorn. It's both spicy like tobacco and very floral. The blackberry, to me, was a very natural pairing, any dark fruit. Um, the bee balm flowers, the purple one there, it's also quite spicy, and a little bit of mint. Apple wood, same thing. Smoke with apple wood all the time, but what does actual wood taste like? So you can get dried wood like those that have a very different flavor than fresh wood, like a sapling. So I have a friend of mine, 
a purveyor friend of mine, lives in Michigan still, and we get this amazing trout roll from him and maple syrup. And I called him up one day and I was like, hey, how about you go out and chop down some trees for me and send them with the trout roll? So he goes out in the woods and he whacks off some maple saplings and throws them in the box and sends them to us. And we make a stock, basically. We boil, we take the branches just like you would chicken carcasses or veal bones or whatever, lamb bones, and we boil the branches in water to make a wood stock. <laughs> and it's incredibly delicious. It's resiny, it's woody, but in a, a really interesting way. So we make ice cream out of it. Um, that's what you see in the top corner there. Another example of ice cream. And we take the stock and we encapsulate it so that when you take that bite, you get that big resiny blast of wood flavor. It's really interesting. All right, so cocktails. We're about to open a bar in Chicago, a lounge cocktail bar. And whenever we enter into these endeavors, like with Alinea, we say we need to break it all apart. Whatever it is, we need to pull it all apart, identify the components, ask a bunch of questions about them, throw out what we don't like, keep what we do like, and then put it all back together in a way that we want. So when we, we start thinking about opening this bar, I mean, naturally, the first thing you say is, what is a cocktail? Those are cocktail sauce. So when you ask people what a cocktail is, they're always going to say liquid. They're going to say spirit, you know, uh, some type of sweetener, some type of dilution. But it's always revolving around liquid. So of course, our immediate reaction was, well, let's make them solid. <laughs> so these are some edible cocktails that we prepared at Alinea. And we see. <laughs> We start thinking about cocktails, and we start thinking about our experience with cocktails and alcoholic beverages. Uh, one of the guys said, hey, I don't know how it came up. Hey, what about that frozen margarita daiquiri thing at TGI Fridays? <laughs> and we said, hey, there might be something there. Like that texture, that frozen slushy texture is something that's really interesting and really good. I think we can make it better than Fridays. <laughs> this is what we came up with. And then we're also freezing the water already in the cocktail that's going to keep it cold without adding water that's going to dilute it later right. on. So right. as it sits, it's not going to it's dilute. Going to, right. It, it, it's going to dilute itself, which will be keeping the integrity of the cocktail. Right. Which is perfect. Right. Like, you're, you know, you're saying the cheesy... Fridays with the strawberry daiquiri. Or so what? We right. make it with perfectly ripe strawberries and beautiful... You know, we make it perfect. Who cares if it's... Pina colada. And in fact, it's kind of funny. Yeah. The pina colada right, right. there. Pina the umbrella, coconut. Right. Right. Delicious. Painkillers. You know, any... You can take any... Any cocktail any, at Tiki books. They're uh, all great, yeah. Tropical, yeah. Tiki. Right. But the presentation of having a liquid in a, in a vessel and coming to the table and pouring it and then only done pouring it, it's actually the slushies. Right. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's really going to freak people out, too, I think. It's, it's really interesting, it, you know... 
if we can if we can come out to your table with something that appears to be liquid and pour it in front of you, and all of a sudden it turns into a slush, that's that's pretty cool. A couple of videos right in a row here, so bear with me. So, so what is the actual cocktail? It's gin and tonic. No, I know, but what is the base is uh, juniper gin from Anchor in uh, San Francisco. Yellow chartreuse, citric acid, uh, a little simple syrup, and then tonic water. And they're just cucumber yeah. encapsulations. Yeah, seasoned cucumber, salt, sugar, cucumber juice, encapsulated. 90, 96-ish of them, depending on how many. Pretty cool. Tastes good too. I'll tell you what, what prevents people from doing this? The labor. The fact that you have almost a hundred balls in there, imagine if you had to make 200 of those a night. Right. It's what, 20,000 balls? I mean, nobody's going to do that right. because they're going to think it's too hard. 200 of these a night. It's a hot cucumber balls. Oh man, cool. I like it. So now with that concept, we get to not only add texture and sensation, but we might be able to play with, imagine if you're starting to drink a cocktail and you're having drinks within a drink. So we could flavor each encapsulation with maybe even a new cocktail. So you might be drinking a gin and tonic and then you pull in an encapsulation that is a different cocktail entirely. So mid-consumption of the gin and tonic, you get something else. Something else and something else and something else. It's really interesting. Another version of the gin and tonic. This one dried. So basically, we said, how come there's no alcohol powder? <laughs> and there's, there's good reasons for that, I'm sure. But <laughs> We said we, we want to try to figure this out because there, there, you can find like spray dried wine in some cases, but not like real, real booze or real, you know, you, can, you can't customize it. So it can tell you what we're doing here. We took a neutral grain spirit and mixed it with the maltodextrin um, and then flavored it as it would be with gin. So juniper, added some lime oil, um, quinine powder, and some sugar and a little bit of baking soda so that when you put it in your mouth, it starts to fizz like your, the tonic was carbonated. So that, that's a fun one. Fun and dangerous. <laughs> We're almost done with this cocktail thing. It's a little tweaks from last time. Pineapple powder, uh, freeze dried pineapples, uh, partially dehydrated pineapple uh, in cubes, uh, partially dried orange supreme, uh, pechoed pudding, finger lime cells, uh, vanilla Malden salt, some raw demerara sugar, pineapple ice, and then in here we have coconut water, coconut milk. Florida Conyer four year with Tuzlum rum and Sailor Jerry. Uh, this is 35 grams. So weighed out. This so is weighed out, the liquid's weighed out. It's the same one we had earlier today. Okay, so we just pour and go. So should just pour everything and go. This is a vast improvement. And then having the coconut milk and just the freeze dried kind of thickens it to a nice pudding texture with chunks of the freeze dried pineapple, fresh pineapple cubes. The fruit's larger too, right? Yeah, the chunks of the fruit are larger. Temperature's good. The ice makes a pretty, yeah, it keeps it cold. Pretty substantial difference. Yeah. 
I mean, the texture is vastly different. It's, you know, the first one tasted really good, but you had to kind of tell yourself very, what it was. Yeah, and it was very thin. Mm -hmm. you know, it was more like a soup and stuff floating, and this is more like a homogenous, creamy pudding texture. Right? It's nice, like, biting into the orange supreme and that bright citrus. The finger lines kind of do it for me, you know, for lack of a better analogy, I guess that sort of caviar burst that you hit. Right, you know, you don't really hear it in your mouth, too. Mm -hmm. There's a nice crunch to it almost, and then it just pops. Yeah, it's, it's pudding, for sure. So it's a alcoholic pudding. <laughs> All right, color. We're almost done. How does color influence flavor? This is not anything new. People talk about this all the time. If, you, if you're looking at something red and you take a bite of an apple, does it taste more like an apple? Or, but we're playing with it at the restaurant. I, I just put that in there because I thought it was interesting how clearly before you even take a bite of the starburst, you're informed about what's to follow by the color. A little bit marketing, but that can cross over into our world as well. Same with the chocolate. Obviously, there's a reason that that wrapper is brown. So we look at the color wheel, and when we're presenting food, we say, how can we make the food look better? Most plates are just white in restaurants. Maybe we ought to look at getting a different color plate for specific to different colors of food stuff that we're going to put on it. So say we're going to do squash. To me, like the orange of the plate on the blue is exciting and dramatic, where the white just looks boring. And so this is what we were really trying to get at. So we started to play with orange foods, trying to make a monochromatic composition on the plate that would be then presented on a blue background, doing the opposite color in the spectrum, and see how we would react to that. Going beyond the plate, we started to think about changing the environment in which you're eating. So what if we had the service team change their clothes, <laughs> depending on what course they were delivering to the table? <laughs> so you start, you, you can watch the food on the tray in relation to the jacket, his jacket color. It really does make a difference, the way you perceive it, before you even take a bite, which I think is something that we're going to play with. There's a lot of possibilities there. I think we're done. That was spectacular, and I'm sure there are some questions. Do we have microphones? We usually have microphones. So, okay, so we have two people with microphones who will randomly choose people whose hands are up to ask questions. So, hi. Um, it, it sounds like a lot, you're adding a lot of stuff to the food, and it, it's almost like it has this Dow chemically sound, sound, you know, um, feel to it. Can you just? I'm sure you're not introducing a lot of artificial chemicals into it. And I was just wondering how natural these, like the maltodextrose and all these other things are. We have a very small repertoire of what we call the magic white powders um, in our spice cabinet. And most of them are things that you eat every day that you don't even realize that you eat. So in other words, when you go to Starbucks and get a latte, there's carrageenan in that cream that they put in your latte or the milk as a stabilizer. Um, so we, you know, we, we definitely use them when we, we use them as a tool to get a desired result. Most of our food doesn't have them in it at all, I would say. But even if it did, I mean, we're talking about seaweed extracts, we're talking about modified corn starches, tapioca-based starches, that's really about it. 
So a question on this side, okay. Make sure you turn the microphone yeah, on. Oh, on. sorry. It's on, actually. Hello? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> In all your experimentation, what was your most successful accident used for service? Most successful accident? Accident. accident. That we used for service? Yeah. Just something you discovered by chance that you weren't originally um, looking for or, or something that just came off by hand? Yeah, I don't, I can't think of any, I mean, I guess probably the raspberry would be a good example of that. But usually the process for creating in the, in the restaurant is that the idea, the seed comes up, we collaborate with a, a small group of chefs that really um, try to wrap their head around the idea. The work is delegated out amongst four or five of us, and then we start going into like a testing phase. And then they're edited and edited and edited. A lot of them never even see the dining room. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't like mistakes. <laughs> so we try to keep those back in the kitchen. Question over here. Yeah, uh, I was keeping track and I heard you mention about six different thickening agents before I lost track. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if I was gonna add three things to my kitchen that my parents didn't have, what would they be and where would I start experimenting? Hmm. I would, I would probably, xanthan gum? Yeah. Um, probably an iota carrageenan, so you can play with dairies, and probably agar agar, yeah. Perfect question for our class. We study thickening agents. So there was somebody on this side. Um, have you ever considered to be more experimental with um, architectural uh, space as well, um, like more uh, bigger dimension? We, it's difficult. We, we hope to, and we had hoped to, and we change the linea as much as we can through a couple of different elements, a couple of different tools that we have. We have LED lighting in the restaurant that can be dialed into basically any color that the human eye can see. So we can wash the walls in different colors depending on what's going on. Um, but really, you're, you're, you're stuck with the space. Unless we come into a concept where you know, we would take a linea on the road, let's say, and go to different venues and diff you know, it's becoming a little bit more popular now for chefs to, there's a, a like a farm dinner, okay? So you would go cook at a farm or something like that. That would be interesting. But with the container that we have, we do the best that we can. I just have a question about the, um, the very specific smells, like the, uh, for example, the pine or even the grass that we have. Um, how does that, you know, pairing those with an individual dish, do you find that that kind of distracts other diners? Because, for example, when everyone opened up the grass, you could smell everywhere around here, even mm -hmm. if you didn't have yours. Or how do you combat that? Well, we tried to. What you have is a really intense version of the grass. Um, there is some bleed over. I mean, it happens, right? But we try to, we try to engineer it so that the smell stays pretty much in the proximity of the table. And we have a generous amount of spacing between tables at the restaurant to try to give people their own little micro environment to enjoy their dinner. But occasionally, like the burning oak leaves, if, I'm walk if somebody's walking through the dining room with a tray of smoldering oak leaves, it's going to get to other tables. Um, but then I ask myself if that is a bad thing, because currently we're serving that dish, and it's fall. So like a fireplace, you know, going in your home or your living room in the middle of winter when you walk in, it smells like winter. So if everybody's smelling grass, it smells like summer. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, did your knowledge of science and chemistry develop as a result of your need to create the kinds of dishes you had in mind, or did you sort of have parallel interests in cooking and science? Um, directly from creating tools and, and knowledge to try to make food. I, I, was, I was a terrible, terrible student. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the whole thing became very popular, I would say, starting around 2000. 
all of these techniques and the different gelling agents and you know the hydrocolloids and all that sort of thing. You know, it was, it was a relatively new thing in Haute cuisine. You know, man, food manufacturing and that sort of thing is different, but now it's become very much on the radar for high-end restaurants and, and chefs. Uh, yeah, I was wondering what, what percentage of, of your time or the restaurant's effort goes into designing dishes and actually cooking? Um, I, pro I personally probably spend an hour or two every day that I'm at the restaurant either conceptualizing or testing. Um, and there's probably seven, eight of us that really devote about that much time every day. So it's a tremendous amount of, of work that's set aside and time, resources, to come up with these things and to make them work, to try to get them to work is pretty time consuming. Hi. Uh, so so I was curious if there was a different uh, ratio between fat and sugar if you're using tapioca maltodextrin, or is it all just one thing? And also, I was curious if there was a way to make like a, a really hot foam, and would it still be stabilized at a really hot temperature, or is it only cooler temperatures? Uh, well, the tapioca depends on, on your base, I would say. It's highly variable. So in the case of the caramel, um, it's going to require less tapioca maltodextrin than, say, I was trying to turn olive oil into a powder. Uh, so it's, it, it kind of really depends on what you're, you, well, we have ratios, but you know, it, it, it depends on what you're trying to dry. And as far as the foam, yeah, we can, there's ways to make hot foams, um, but you would have to pick your stabilizing and your aeration component, depending on what you want. So in other words, you might use soy lecithin or you might use gelatin. If you're going to have a cold foam, you would use gelatin, obviously. Soy lecithin is going to give you something that's stable at a hot temperature. Of? I mean, we, we, we have them on the menu all the time. So currently, we're doing a cider foam um, that goes with a pheasant dish, apple cider, soy lecithin, salt. Is there a ratio for that? Uh, it's 1,000 1, grams of base to 12 grams of soy. You know, the science of foams is the topic of next week. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Somebody on this side. Who has the microphone? All right. So um, roasted hay, wood stalks, Where apparently turned into very tasty things. There has to be some really abysmal fail failures you would never wish on the tongues of even your worst enemies. Do no, you, I mean. <laughs> no particularly memorable <laughs> ones you can share? There's tons of failures, but we know that going in. Like, we. We're not afraid to fail, but like I said, we just edit. So if something's not turning out, then we, we simply just abandon it or put it away and come back to it later. Yeah. So, hi. Um, has there been an experience or an aroma that you simply have not been able to captivate? Which is a little bit like that question. So I'll add another one. How do you feel about the perfume industry? <laughs> um, <clears throat> We, we struggled for a long time with a fireplace aroma. And then we just said, we're just going to burn a log and plate the food on it and send it out to the dining room. <laughs> so that, I mean, we were overthinking it, basically. We were trying to capture the smoke and the smell and all that. And we just said, well, we'll just serve the burning log. <laughs> so that's what we did this past winter. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a chef in California and San Francisco that deals a lot with perfumes. Uh, Daniel Patterson, and certainly there's some there's an avenue there for you know a collaboration with perfumiers and, and chefs. I think it really would make a lot of sense. So I, well, let's have two more questions, one from each side. Um, you deal with a lot of thickeners and a lot of different different chemicals and, and all these, I mean, you've named countless amounts. What, what do you use for resources? Do you find them as they come along? Or do you, do you have books? Or I mean, do you just call up Harold McGee every time you have a question? Or? <laughs> um, it's a combination of books, people coming to us now, you know, uh, with 
whatever they have. And it's becoming very popular in progressive cooking. So all the purveyors have, you know, a lineup of different gelling agents and different emulsifiers and that sort of thing. And we're also um, a member of IFT. So when they have a trade show in Chicago, we typically go and wander around the show. And what is International Food Technologists. I'm sorry? Is it just in Chicago? No, I believe it's nationwide. Yeah, and they have, they have a show every year in Chicago. So what? So last question, right over here. Where does the name Alinea come from? Have you chosen to have your kitchen uh, on a floor below the dining room? And how much would a typical dinner for two uh, be likely to go for? <laughs> Alinea basically means the beginning of a new train of thought. And all my research on it was that when paper was a rare commodity a long time ago, rather than skip a line to start a new paragraph, they would just write that symbol so they wouldn't waste paper. Uh, check average, 330 with wine. Our menu is 195 for just the food. It's 25 courses. We only have one menu. So you come in and you eat that, and that's it. You don't order. There's no a la carte. You don't get to make any choices. You come in, sit down, and you enjoy the show. If you want the wine pairing, it comes in, which most people do. It comes in right around 150. Tax and gratuity. It's expensive. So with that, oh, the kitchen. We've thought about that. I think it would be interesting. The problem is actually the inverse. In other words, do you really want to be in the kitchen looking up the dresses and skirts of diners? <laughs> and how do they feel about that? <laughs> I always thought it would be cool to look down in the kitchen, but you also have to look up. So that sounds like an excellent note upon which to thank. <laughs>